Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on this Thursday, the 18th of May, 2023. My name is Freddie Gray. I am the Deputy Editor of The Spectator and I will be your host today. On the show this week, we have Migration Nation. The cover of The Spectator this week uh, is about the news that the government is about to announce that uh, there will be 700,000 net immigrants into Britain, legal immigrants into Britain this year. Fraser Nelson has written that cover piece. He'll be talking to Nigel Farage, who probably needs no introduction. Uh, we will then talk about a related subject, which is conservatism uh, and the National Conservative Conference, which was held in Westminster this week. I'll speak to two speakers at that conference. That's uh, Mary Harrington of Unheard and Tim Stanley of The Telegraph. And after that, we'll move to foreign affairs. And uh, I'll talk to Paul Wood about Evgeny Prigozhin, who is emerging as the potential rival to Vladimir Putin in Russia. Or is he? You never know when it comes to Russia news. And lastly, I will talk about artificial intelligence and dating, which is a very weird, weird world. Uh, I'll be joined by Jake Kaslaski, who runs an AI dating service called Keeper. But before we get going, I must thank our brilliant sponsors, Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management. They are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who offer you unwavering support through challenging times. Visit candowealth.com for more information. To begin, let me hold up uh, this week's spectator again. Migration Nation is the cover piece and it's about the news that the government is expected to soon announce or even admit that uh, legal migration, net legal migration, is somewhere around 700,000 immigrants coming into this country. Uh, it's a lot higher than was expected, and Fraser Nelson explores the possibility that it may be being used to cover up the large number of British people who are on benefits. He joins me now to explain his thesis, along with the politician turned broadcaster, Nigel Farage. Fraser, I think what people will find most striking about your piece is uh, that Brexit seems to have meant more immigration, not less, because that was not what we were told it would do. Now, during the campaign, both the Leave and Remain campaigns argued that Brexit would mean significantly less immigration. You couldn't find any economic analysis of Brexit that didn't assume that mig net migration would go down quite significantly. Mm. Now, you had some people on the Leave campaign were saying, you know what, this is what we need, fewer migration, and therefore scarce workers have become more scarce, therefore the salaries go up. And on the Remain side, uh, there was a moment where Stuart Rose, the former MS chief, was in question time, and he rather famously said, yes, um, there'll be fewer migration, that means more good for labourers, and labour costs will go up, and that's not a good thing. Mm. So you had the two sides agreeing on whether, disagreeing on whether it was good or bad, that you would end up with less migration and perhaps higher salaries for the low paid. Um, you could argue, yeah, people would be paying more money for their pizza, the waiters are paid more, you know, that kind of argument. But nobody disagreed that Brexit would significantly lower migration and it would be a better way of managing globalisation. That they basically it's got a bit out of control under the Blair period. In many ways, almost the whole point of leaving the EU was to take back control of border policy so we would exit the system of free movement and being able to decide how many we'd want. What we now find is when they've taken back control, the government's giving almost 500,000 visas a year. And when you include the students, who nowadays apparently have got one and two dependents in tow, the number hits 700,000 or probably more. We're going to get that next week. But this isn't an accident because Rishi Sunak has now got complete control. He can decide whether to issue a visa or not. So this is deliberate policy, but one that hasn't been announced and one that hasn't been explained. And I think it should be. Well, we should say that by spectator office standards, you are something of a dove on immigration. You're certainly a dove compared to the man sitting on your left. Uh, but you still find this very troubling because, because of unemployment, because of long-term sickness, because of the fact that a lot of uh, British natives are in 
uh, a welfare trap, essentially. Yeah, I think the mass immigration has been overall quite a stunning success for Britain. Um, we have had a massive um, demographic change. One in five of our workers now is foreign born. Um, I think in London, um, half of all children have got an immigrant mother, including, I should say, my own three kids. I'm contributing to this phenomenon. Um, and I think that we've managed it in an incredibly successful way. If you look at the coronation, for example, a couple of weeks ago, we had a Hindu Prime Minister, Buddhist Home Secretary, Muslim Mayor of London, Muslim First Minister of Scotland. In no other country in the world would you have had this picture of successful integration. So we pulled it off very, very well. And I think we continue to pull it off well. We're finding out of the statisticians that we're getting three quarters of a million net migration. There hasn't been riots in the street about it. There's no populist party. I mean, a while ago, Nigel was running the Brexit party talking about immigration. They were used to becoming first in the European elections only a few years ago. Now there is nothing, nothing to the right of the Conservatives. Richard Tice's lot fielded 500 uh, candidates of the locals. They got something like five or six candidates through. A dreadful success rate. So we don't have any what you might call anti-immigrant populist party or anything approaching that description, either in Parliament or in the opinion polls. So the public seem to be quite happy with this. If there isn't happiness, it hasn't expressed itself politically. Now, where I'm concerned is I think, although immigration works very well, it can perhaps work too well. The temptation politically to use this to cover up the failures of the welfare state is very great. Like earlier on this week, we had figures coming out showing 5.3 million Brits are now to work benefits. We would really notice this if it wasn't for mass immigration because we wouldn't have anybody to run the economy. But when we can cover it up with mass migration, it works. Nigel, you made some waves this week by saying that Brexit has failed. Uh, do you? Do, well, was, well was hang it, on a second. That, I said Brexit's okay. failed because of what the government's done with it. Yes. You know, number one, we haven't actually helped business. Businesses are leaving. We've got a brain drain going on for the first time since the 1970s. Secondly, there's an absolute breach of trust with the electorate over immigration. Mm. It's absolutely perfectly clear. The only reason we won that referendum were people turning out on council estates in the Midlands of the North, thinking, do you know what? This is the one time my vote can make a difference. Uh, and thirdly. Uh, Brexit is failing because it's actually turned out that our politicians are about as useless as the European Commission. Now, you know, that doesn't mean voting to get back sovereignty was wrong. Far from it. But in the minds of ordinary Brexit voters, this isn't working. And I'd remind Fraser there were a third group of people in that referendum uh, talking about immigration. Those that didn't want to talk about it at all. I remember being told, you know, by Hannan and Boris Johnson, no, 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 don't discuss immigration in the referendum, we'll lose the referendum. You know, some of our very posh friends don't like this sort of thing. Uh, in the end, they were forced to talk about it reluctantly. But they never, ever, Boris never intended to reduce the numbers of people coming into this country. So the first fundamental question to address is that breach of faith. I think it's very strong and very real. And secondly, let me say this. The electorate assumed with Brexit that immigration had been dealt with. And they're now beginning to understand that it hasn't been dealt with. And you may well say there's no populist party in British politics at the moment. There will be. It's coming. The disconnect, the disconnect is bigger now than it was in 2010. I could see in 2010 that the political and media class in London just had no idea what everybody else in the country was talking about. And I think we're heading back to that and quite quickly. Let's get on to the, the future of populist politics in a moment, because I think that's where this should go. Um, for now, it's fair to say, um, polls suggest that immigration has dipped as the, in, in terms of the issue which voters consider most important. I think it's now fourth, or is it fifth now? Well, if it's not being discussed, that's not surprising. I mean, if there is no coverage of the issue, and people don't know what's going on, that's not surprising. The reason, the reason that immigration became the big political issue that it was is that people in their minds linked it to membership of the European Union. That was what the UKIP surge was all about. That's what you successfully did. Yes, and it took me years, it yeah. took me years to make that connection. And I, from 2004, I said to all the people working with me, once I can make this connection, this political party is going to a different place. I think, over the course of the next year or two, people will start to make the connection that the reason there's a housing crisis is mass immigration. The reason they can't get a GP appointment is mass immigration. The reason their lives are more miserable than they were 10 years ago, their quality of life is diminishing, 
is because of the population crisis and explosion in this country. Right, but in what way is it a crisis? You're living in London, earning good money, living in a lovely house, talking about rich Hindus who happen to be our Prime Minister. Go out onto the council estates, meet people. I think you'll see the odds. Do you know, my driver, my driver, my driver's kid didn't go to school last year. The school's too full. 13 years old, not at school. Right, so your driver, he, what you're saying that the f local authorities refuse to provide his child with a place because there are no education places. That's right. I and very it's happening, much it's happening that. all over the country. It doesn't, it's illegal for councils to refuse people. No, no. Home education has been given online, no place at schools. You go to Lincolnshire, for example, you'll find four and a half, five year olds, maybe 20 miles on a bus to get to school. You, there is a population explosion that is damaging and diminishing the quality of life of ordinary folk in this country. If you don't see it now, I promise you, you will see. But, but why is it, when I, what I can't work out is this, if there is this, um, this anger, mm. then why hasn't it got no political expression? Why does, um, no. you, 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 why did the Reform Party do so incredibly badly just a few weeks ago? If, you, we'll, if we polled a thousand people in Stoke-on-Trent now and asked who the Reform Party was, I wonder how many would know that it even exists. You know, that's the problem. You know, we may know because we live in this world, mm. ordinary folk don't know. And actually establishing political movements is not an easy thing to do. And reform is effectively, you know, it may be a follow on from the Brexit party, but effectively it's a new political party. So two things I would say. Number one, the reason we're not seeing this expressed more is because it's not been given voice, but it's beginning to be. We're having this national debate now about numbers. And, and number two, there's not a political leader that people can see at this moment in time, voicing their concerns. Once those connections are made between, I mean, everything, even travel, even travel, even, even the length of journeys, potholes in the roads, these are all symptoms of a population crisis. And it's going to dominate British politics over the next 10 years. Is it not a problem then that, if, as you say, for, because of Brexit, or Brexit came about because people linked the European yeah. Union and mass migration, now people will say, well, we've had Brexit and we still have mass migration. No, no, no. What they'll say is they lied to us. Yeah. They lied to us. You know? But maybe they want us <laughs> control over immigration. That's the big difference. Can I, can I, can I put it to you, Nigel? That before, there was palpably no control. Um, we, free movement, that's what yeah. it means, right? You can control it. Now, right now, if you look at who's coming in, there are different people, but not the Poles. The Indians are now number one, followed, I think, by Australians. Then you have Nigerians, then you have Americans. Now, to get a visa for this country, you need to be over a certain salary threshold, you need to speak English, you need to be getting a job in well, a certain profession. That's, 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 those are the well, criteria. Well, hang on a second, hang on a second. I mean, the salary criteria, when, when Australia does this, it says we're short of engineers, we're short of people in these sectors, we will open up spaces in this sector. In nearly every single case, those that go to Australia are earning more than the average wage. What this government have done is they've lowered the thresholds to the most unimaginable levels, where actually the threshold to come in is eight to 10,000 pounds lower than the average wage. That's why the numbers are where they are. They have deliberately engineered this, and of course, they've got their big business friends encouraging it. But equally, as you point out in your article, there is this massive welfareism problem of 5.3 million people. And it appears at the minute that no political party's got the courage to take that on. So it's all well and good to say you have to pass these tests to come in. But we've set the threshold so low in terms of qualifications and income, as, if, as for it to almost be meaningless. Maybe this is making it more palatable, though. Maybe that is why, when there's a recent poll asking people all over the world, what do you think of immigration? Britain emerged as the most pro-immigrant country in the world, other than, I think, Norway. And I wonder if that's because we see the migration differently now. Now that the Brexit has come along, we know that to get a visa you need a job. Nobody's really talking about lazy foreigners who aren't really, you know, these are people who are by and large more likely to work and then Brits now. Nobody, nobody was ever talking about lazy foreigners. That was never the argument. The argument was about wage compression. The argument was about difficulties getting on a social housing lists. The argument was about fundamental changes in community. The argument was about the fact, well, why is no one speaking English in this street? They were very, very different arguments. And they, and they were arguments very firmly rooted around community, around family, and of course the ironic social conservatism of so many Labour voters, you know, which actually is still there. I mean, you know, those red wall voters are surprisingly small c conservative and patriotic people in many, many ways. So, no, I think that uh, the idea that, well, we've got back control, we, we've chosen not to use it, but we've got control, so we're all happy, is, I think it's for the birds. Uh, I mean, you focused a lot on illegal migration in your, in your immigration, uh, yes. in your journalism and so on. Yes. Uh, do you think the fact that that is such a media 
uh, preoccupation distracts from the, the, well, the, the, the issue of legal migration, which, as you say, is... The reason is, I did is, that, the reason I went on this illegal immigration thing back in sort of late 19, early 20, is because nobody else wanted to talk about it. It was literally being buried under the carpet. So I thought, well, I'm going to you know, cause a bit of noise on this and get... Because it was obvious to me in 2020 that the numbers that came would explode because virtually nobody was being deported anywhere else and you can come in, be put in a hotel. You still... And you literally, stay in a four-star hotel and go to work every day in the black economy and earn cash. It's happening all over the country. So I pushed that because I, I wanted it to become a big issue. Also because, you know, my fear from 2015... And the reason that I used that breaking point poster that so upset the metropolitan elite is that the EU have made the same mistake with the Mediterranean. Um, and I feared, I feared that unless we got a grip through Brexit, that we'd face a similar wave. Now, it may not be the same numerically, but symbolically, the boats crossing the English Channel is. And by the way, the numbers that have crossed into Europe so far across the Med is trouble last year. So there's more of this coming. But ironically... Yes, everyone's now become so focused on what's been happening illegally with 46,000 people last year that you're right, it's, 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 it's kind of stopped us talking yes. about legal net numbers. I remember you accepted an award at the Spectators Parliamentarian of the Year Awards uh, a few years ago and you said, you'll never hear from me again. <laughs> well, <laughs> I have to ask you, do you think that there's obviously a space opening up to the right of Rishi Tunak, particularly on the issue of immigration? Will, yeah. you, will you be going back I into... Think it's, I think it's bigger than that. I think the absolute betrayal of the five and a half million men and women who are sole traders and self-employed. I mean, you can't believe the anger in that community out there. They loathe the Conservative Party. They fear Labour will be even worse, but they loathe the Conservative Party. The complete lack of understanding of how the IR35 rules in practice are working in the building industry, etc. So it isn't just on immigration. There is a, I think the sense of detachment that the conversations that are happening in Westminster are so far removed from all the people's lives. I mean, when I campaigned with the Brexit Party in 2019, quite successfully, we got rid of Mrs May, and I'm rather proud of that. But the slogan we campaigned on wasn't even about Brexit. It was change politics for good. There was a hope and a feeling that a different kind, a more engaged kind of politics would come from Brexit. None of that's happened. So the answer to your question is very simple. The gap that is opening up in British politics on the centre-right um, is potentially bigger than it was with UK. Yeah. I, mean, it, I mean, it's a very, very big gap. You very skillfully didn't listen to the second part of my question, which is, will you try and fill that gap? Well, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't finished yet. Just okay. give, just give me, Sorry. Give me <laughs> a moment. I wasn't <laughs> ignoring you. I can be accused of many things, but not ignoring <laughs> questions. So the potential is there, and something or someone at some point is going to fill it. You know, I, I, I sort of call it an anger gap. Now, it depends who fills that anger gap. I hope and believe what I did before was a positive way of filling it by saying, let's get our sovereignty back as a means of dealing with these problems. Before I came along, the ang or really came to prominence, the anger gap was being filled by Nick Griffin. And it's very easy to forget, between 2005 and 2010, the extent to which the BNP were laying down roots, you know, in those northern town councils, etc. I, I haven't decided what I'm going to do. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Um, I, I do feel that a large chunk of the country deserves some representation and, and deserves a voice. Equally, um, I'm still pretty bruised by the 2015 general election. I mean, how can you get four million votes in one seat? It makes it a very difficult thing to do. I, I haven't decided what I'm going to do, but something's going to come along. And if it's not me, it'll be, it'll be a Nick Griffin Mark II. You know, we will, we will have a rise of something way out on the right. It's happening as we speak all over Europe, albeit aided by a proportional representation system. Something is going to change. Something is going to crack. Um, and I think, coming back to UK politics, uh, you know, I, I think I've got a better understanding of those red wall voters than, than pretty much anybody, frankly. Um, they were the people that were the backbone that built UKIP up into being a major party in British politics. And if the Conservative Party on its current course thinks it's got any chance of winning a single one of those seats, that, that, that I'm afraid they're deluded. The only thing that might save us is this. The one thing the Conservative Party is really good at is survival. You know, it's been around for a couple of hundred years. It exists to attempt to get power and to hold power. So they've still got time, I guess, if they chose to be genuinely radical, but I can't see it happening. By radical, you mean cutting the number of visas issued? That's your definition. Because the funny yes. thing is, we've just had local elections, 
I don't know how many parties of various stripes to different pieces. Not a sign, not a sniff of the sort of anger that you're talking about. So, no, because no, but I wonder, because, is it real or might it be? Because there's no way. But, but that, was the, that, you know, that was the same effectively before 2010. You know, other than the BNP. No, you were just telling us Nick Griffin was getting a huge number of votes. There was palpable anger then. The the BNP in the North, but they had a big presence. At the moment, if you want to vote that way, there's nobody giving voice to it. That's the gap in the market. But it looks like a lot of those voters are going back to Labour now. Yes, I've met them this weekend. Yeah, I've met them this weekend. Why do you think they're going back to Labour? Is it because Keir Starmer's talking to the right on some things? No, I just I think this Tory party they, they they don't identify with these Conservative politicians at all. They briefly did with Boris for a bit. He seemed rather fun. Uh, he seemed rather normal. Are they, they identify with Keir Starmer, do they? No, not really. So why are they going back to Labour? Because they're tribal Labour. That's where they come from. They've been voted. Their families have voted Labour since 1918. You know, the, the, the sort of the gateway drug of UKIP and the Brexit party took them to the Conservatives in 2019. And that was on a Brexit. Let's get this thing sorted out. Let's get back control of our borders. Um, but they're going back to Labour because that's where they're from. And, the concern, and, 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 and I think there's also a profound sense of disappointment that the Brexit thing has not worked out the way they really wanted it to. I think we'll wrap it up there. But uh, thank you very much, Nigel, for coming in. And thank you very much for talking about your cover piece. Now, speaking of opportunities opening up on the political right, there's been a, a big conference in London this week in Westminster, the National Conservatism Conference, which is... Uh, uh, an American import, um, but starred lots of Tory MPs and various Conservative figures from the Anglo-American community. Um, and two of the speakers at that conference join me now, um, Tim Stanley of The Telegraph and Mary Harrington of Unheard. Um, Tim, perhaps you could start by telling our viewers a little bit about what national conservatism is, what this particular movement is, and what they're trying to do and could you also tell us whether they, they succeeded in doing it in London this week? Someone put it to me brilliantly that this conference was a seminar masquerading as a rally. So some academics put on a seminar in the centre of London. They invited politicians and the politicians then turned it into a platform to make it a debate about the future of the Conservative Party. So to back up a little bit, there is a, an academic who's Israeli called Yoram Hazoni who is an expert on conservative political theory. A little bit of Zionism blended with some uh, nationalism, with some American exceptionalism. And of course, he's got a profound interest in Britain as well, because Britain is the home uh, of Enlightenment era conservative thinking. And has only wrote uh, a couple of books about conservatism and about nationalism and came up with this. Uh, well, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say he came up with the idea. It's been around for a while, but he he helped to uh, to make concrete this idea that at the center of conservative thinking should be the life of the nation, not the individual, not free markets, not getting rich, but actually making your country a better, happier, healthier place. It's about rerouting the individual within their community. Uh, he also argues that because it's about the nation, conservatism will look different from one place to another. So national conservatism has managed to get a big intellectual audience in the United States. It's got some money behind it. And they have been traveling the world for the last couple of years, holding conferences in various places. Uh, They've been, I think, to Italy, they've been to Belgium, been to America, and now they're here in Britain. And in each case, the reaction and the response has been different, and the nature of the conference has been different in a way that reflects that idea that conservatism will vary from one country to another. So as I said, national conservatism came to London, they invited politicians, and they happened to do so at a moment in which the Conservative Party is cracking up. And uh, a sort of a section of the parliamentary Conservative Party, which is socially conservative, I'd say quite a quite a small section, and which is grouped around Suella Braverman, took this as an opportunity to get a platform to lay out their ideas about nationhood. And of course, probably in this country right now, uh, the most potent conservative national issue is immigration. And that was the one that came up repeatedly. But as I say, there's, there's a slight tension between uh, what some of us were there to do at the conference, which was to share ideas, discuss Hazoni's work, provide criticism, and there was a lot of criticism as well, And what politicians did, which was turn up and make speeches that got headlines, which was fantastic for building the brand of national conservatism, because even though uh, it's not terribly well known, and a lot of people still don't know who Professor Harzoni is, uh, that phrase is now on everyone's lips in Westminster. Mary, you were talking about uh, biology and feminism and and not party politics. Do you you agree with Tim that there 
I mean, I, I thought perhaps it was, I, I came and saw some of your speeches. Uh, I thought it was a shame in a way that this sort of potentially quite interesting subject to debate, obviously controversial, obviously makes headlines and so on, but it did also become a sort of, uh, it felt a bit like Tory party conference, the, the right wing version. Perhaps a little bit. I mean, my sense um, from from spending some time in the in the breakout conversations and 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 really in the in the speeches as well is that there are a great many parallels with um with with some of the national conservatives and conferences that I've attended elsewhere actually and on on this in the sense that if you if you have a conversation about conservative invari- conservatism invariably there are going to be some politicians there and politicians are going to politic that's what they do um, so invariably, you're going to get some stump speeches and you're going to get some people who are thinking very concretely about how, how this is going to play to electorates and, and, and really singing, singing a tune in that key. Um, but there are a great many other reasons to attend a conference like that. And one of the things that came across very clearly to me was that there's a you know, much as much I've, I've written about this before much as an, on other similar occasions, even elsewhere, there's a, there's quite a noticeable difference between the way the typically typically older politicians making stump speeches are thinking about these questions and and the way some of the younger attendees of which there are surprisingly many i mean when i was when, when i 20 years ago if you went to a conservatism event it was mostly sort of crusty old buffers in corduroy and there was a sense that you get in some anglican you know, provincial anglican churches that there's really nobody there under <laughs> pretty much under retirement age and that it wasn't like that at all i think something like 40 percent of the attendees at the event in london that just finished were under 30. Um, you know, start a really for a for a conservative event, a surprising number of them were students. I spoke to a great many 22, 23 year old young men, men and women who are who are really grappling with you know the big questions. And I think and there was a there was a very noticeable gulf between the way those young people were approaching these questions and the way the stump speech makers who who are really engaging with a Westminster political audience were were approaching these questions. Now I think it's it's good and healthy and right that we're going to have different approaches and different different priorities you know within within an overall umbrella and it was it was very interesting to bring those groups together and to and to begin to tease out where some of those some of those blind spots are and i think there are there's potentially some some reflection to be done on on that on those gaps um that that, that might be beneficial overall to people within westminster going forward tim you you've written a lot about american politics and i'm sure you've been to uh, American conferences like that about conservatism, and there's there's a lot of that in America. You know, whether conservatism is a big question that the right has been asking itself for ages. Do you think it suits uh, British Toryism to have these uh, sort of sometimes quite intellectualized conversations? That does is it something that the American movement conservatism can sort of adapt into British conservatism? Yeah. A lot of the media pounced on the idea that this is an American import and even an American infiltration and takeover of the Conservative Party. Uh, but Freddie, you've been to US conferences, and as you know, they always begin uh, with smoke machines, with the eye of the tiger, uh, and <laughs> with a woman and a man coming out and saying, hi, thank you for coming, woo! There was none of that. In fact, there were barely any American speakers Uh, And indeed, there was a great deal of media misrepresentation of the conference and the people who spoke at it. Uh, This was, in some regards, one of the most multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-religious conferences that I have been to in this country. Um, And some of the speakers who attacked for individual things they said, so the speaker who said we're not having enough babies was a woman. Um, Suella Braverman, the speaker who said we need to do more to control immigration, is a person of colour. Uh, Yoram Hazoni uh, is himself Israeli. Uh, there were a large number of Jewish delegates there. Uh, so, so the idea that this this was some kind of right wing ethno nationalist thing, I, I found really quite preposterous, and was based upon one or two tweets which were put out by the by the organisation's media team, who obviously themselves took no offence at those particular tweets. Um, but d- does this is this does this go down well? Well, I, I think if they don't do this, there's really nothing else. Uh, you're right, by the infrastructurally in America, there are things like Heritage, which do this sort of conference all the time. And they bring people from across a very much larger country who would otherwise not meet. And they get to share ideas and they get to promote candidacies and things like that. Um, We haven't really been doing that in Britain. And that helps to explain why there's a paucity of fresh ideas. 
And some of the ideas coming out of this conference really went against the grain of British conservative thinking. Uh, and it's, uh, in some ways, the conference was more left wing than it was reported and was understood. So, for example, Danny Kruger gave a speech where, again, people jumped upon the fact that he referred to the normative family. We can have a debate about whether or not that is an accurate or, or fair or kind description of families. But if you read the other 99 percent of the speech, he was essentially saying that many of the problems of Britain are down to conservative economics and have been down to the legacy of Thatcherism and individualism and atomization. So actually, some of the speakers at this conference are on a journey towards the left, not towards the right. And it was very frustrating that people didn't look beyond the tweets and actually notice that. Mary, do you not think that this has been talked about in, in the media and in uh, perhaps highbrow circles of the right, you could call them, uh, for a long time? Uh, you know, Post-liberalism, red Toryism, blue Labour, there's a there's an there's long been a feeling that something new has got to happen in politics beyond uh, the, the, you know, the Thatcher, Reagan, neoliberalism, if you like, that's not a great word for it, but I think that's what most people use. And yet it never really has materialised beyond the odd conference, the odd sort of moment where people get excited about it. It doesn't really speak to electorates. I think you're right. I mean, it's it's too early to tell, I think, as as a, a, a Chinese premier once said about the French Revolution, whether or not it worked. It's, it's, it's too early to tell whether this is never going to materialise. One of the things actually I thought was interesting about the the really very strong media reaction, and I, and I agree with Tim when he says that I think it's been that there have been some bad faith representations of what was discussed i mean one of the one of the standout speeches for me was an, was an economist who was making the case that capitalism is structurally antinatalist and this is not simply an effect of bad policy this is not simply an effect of you know real thatcherism has never been tried this is structural and and the and, and there, are, there are a great many other social ills that it propagates besides which is a profoundly pr- profoundly left-wing idea and i think the the thinker that was referenced most frequently in that speech was karl marx and this is not something that the guardian is ever going to report about national conservatism conference because it just doesn't compute but i think one of the things that was that was interesting about this conference and about the very intense and sometimes bad faith media representation of it is that up until now, you, as you say, post liberal ideas or you know, the right, these the, the, this sort of caucus of ideas, the upper right hand quadrant, I think, as as the nerds call it, you know, the economically left and 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 socially right um, quadrant of ideas has been sort of kicking around amongst politics nerds for some time, um, but has hasn't has yet to gain any sort of mainstream traction. I think part of the issue there is that there has been a great deal of um, amongst the respectable people it's there's a certain amount of effort that's gone into making sure that those ideas are non you and in as much as they appear at all um, it they they've been they've been fairly methodically coded as low status and as not as just not something that ever gets discussed amongst respectable people in in zone 1 it just doesn't happen and i think part of the reason that the media has been so upset about this conference is that this it, 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 it that's just not manifestly not the case you know here was a conference where really those ideas are being discussed and it's happening in westminster um, and and furthermore, there are there are some quite there are some household names there, and and so and so in that sense, I mean, it, it, it's probably too early to tell whether any whether it really this is just going to end up being recouped, as some critics from the right have suggested, by you know this sort of ne- neoliberalism in in a, in a fancy dress, you know, with some with with neoliberalism plus culture war is the worst case scenario, really, you know, that this this just gets recouped and we get more of the same with 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 occasional diatribes about woke. Um, but it, it's uh, it's too early to tell whether 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 it's going to go that way or whether in fact some of the some of the more interesting thinking and the more creative thinking, which which I I agree is still is still fringe relative to the stump speech stuff. But there's the, there's still a chance that some of that might percolate through, um, and and I think it's if it does so, it will be in the teeth of all the respectable people working very hard to code it as low status and as just not something which is even within the Overton window. But the fact that this conference happened in Westminster was a it, it was a fairly a fairly forceful shove against the parameters of the Overton window. And I think that's a that, that's a positive step. It really is. Uh, Tim, we just had Nigel Farage uh, on Spectator TV and he was talking about um, how the Tory party always survives somehow because uh, despite uh, the fact it's probably going to face uh, an election loss in, in the coming uh, months. Uh, do you think, looking at the way British Tory politicians treated this conference, do you think the Conservative Party is going to adapt to this movement? 
um, or is it going to shun it? How is it going to adapt and survive? Some of the biggest pushback against the conference came from what you might call liberal conservatives, many of whom did not attend it, didn't pay attention to what was said. I, I would just add on a side note, by the way, I was struck by the things that were not discussed at this conference. No one said, bring back the British Empire. No one said, ban abortion. Uh, there, there, there's a whole host of old issues which are totally off the table now and everyone's moved on from. And yet they're the things that there's often an assumption right wingers are saying and they're simply not part of their narrative at all anymore. But there, there was a big pushback among liberal conservatives who are very powerful and influential within the party. That said, I think away, uh, away from the conference, there is a growing and influential group of people uh, who feel that uh, the economic policy approach has been wrong. We need more industrial policy. I wouldn't say protectionism versus free trade. That's a very, that's a silly way of simplifying it. But there's a sense that there's, there's got to be a move away from the idea that the job of government is simply to get out the way. And, and, and that, I think, is the most significant shift in conservative thinking. And you might even find it among some liberal conservatives. Some Tories are starting to say, we have an idea of how people ought to be living. They should be having families. They should be buying homes. But the economic situation doesn't actually allow them to do that. So how do we create the material circumstances under which people can do those things? Uh, and some of that might involve creative government action. Now, there, so for, to give a concrete example, uh, the debate around the best way to do childcare. We all know that one reason why people are not having children, why one people are not settling down is because of the extortionate cost of raising a child. Uh, and now I think almost everyone's recognised that within the Conservative Party, that that's a failing, and that's a failure that's happened under the Tories. The debate is, should it be uh, through the state sponsoring childcare, where you leave your kid with someone, or, as people like Miriam Cates and some of the National Conservatives would prefer, the state making it more, making it easier for women to stay at home and raise the child themselves. So there's a cultural clash over what do women want. But actually, I think Conservatives are coming around to the idea that there are areas of policy that government has to take an interest in, even if it starts to sound a bit like socialism. Because if they don't do it, you end up with a very unconservative outcome, which is people not having babies or dropping out of the workforce, which is bad for the hallowed word growth. Mary, you, you spoke about uh, women, the body, biology, uh, but I have noticed there wasn't a lot of talk about the NHS or the National Health Service. Do you think that's because it's not a policy um, conference, it's, a, it's an ideas conference, or do you think it's because nobody really wants to tackle the NHS on the right one way or the other? That's a very interesting question. You know, I hadn't actually, it hadn't actually struck me until you pointed it out just now that nobody was really talking about the NHS uh, at the conference. But you're absolutely right. Nobody was talking about the NHS. Um, I, to be honest, I think it's almost certainly the case that nobody is tackling it because it's just too big. It's just too big and, and it touches on too much stuff. I mean, I, I forget who it was who quit that, you know, we're, we're now a health service with a sort of vestigial country attached. And there is a, there is a sense of that. And nobody, nobody quite knows what to do about it. And I mean, I think in, in as much as it was referenced, it was probably obliquely um, in the several, several talks, actually, who spoke about the impossibility of continuing an abundant welfare state with a collapsing population. Uh, which is which is the the existential issue for a lot of things, and is a, is an extremely uncomfortable, wicked problem. Um, when you start looking at the confluence of you know the, where where social solidarity converges with high taxation, converges with support for the welfare state, support converges with population you know, growth or shrinkage, you know there's, there's a real wicked problem there, which we're which we're already confronting. I mean, if you're unless you're unless you're pregnant or very old where i live in small town in small town england you know you can you you'll be lucky if you get an, a gp appointment within 6 weeks that's just that's just the reality in a lot of places now um if it's if people are if 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 people weren't talking about it it's almost certainly just because it's too big and too radioactive i mean you can't you can't do it in a 15 minute speech and and people people are trying to but they may be trying to zoom out a little bit and thinking about the structural questions which have brought us to the point where 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 a health service with a vestigial country attached and and trying trying a few different angles to see if we can see if we can come at some of those some of those thorny issues from 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 different perspectives and, and find creative ways of thinking about it well, tim you made uh, the point in your speech. you did mention the national health service because you said that people who are uncomfortable with the national in national conservatism should should think about the National Health Service. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, obviously, people are uncomfortable about the word national being involved, being attached to a political label, because in their mind, uh, it automatically goes to national socialism. And I joked that uh, if that is the case, then we're also going to have to crack down on the National Trust, the NSPCC and the NHS. Um, but Mary's right, the NHS didn't come up. I think that's partly because this is an academic audience, because there was some transatlantic crossover. And it, it's not a debate which I think some of our guests would have particularly understood or enjoyed in the same way that I'm, I'm not sure if you had this kind of conference, it would have been appropriate to discuss Medicare and the very particular debates around health insurance in the United States. The other issue we did not discuss is Ukraine, which I think was partly a conscious decision by the conference, uh, because if you open up a conversation about Ukraine, I don't think you'd get anyone who says Vladimir Putin's great, but you're always terrified someone's going to turn up to speak who is Russian adjacent, right? Uh, who, who is sympathetic in some way. Uh, and, and I think there was a little bit of political control there. That the conference didn't want to go down that rabbit hole. But I think it might also just be that uh, there's another issue that we didn't discuss because it's not something that's part of the British rights vocabulary. There is almost 99.9% support for Ukraine among British conservatives. And so there was no real need to touch it uh, because we are pretty much united on that subject. Well, uh, I, it's not that I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but we do have to wrap that up. So um, thank you very much, Tim. And thank you, Mary. Now, if you've been reading the news about the war in Ukraine, you've probably come across the name Evgeny Prigozhin. He is the leader of the Wagner Group, the mercenary group that Russia is using for its fight in Ukraine. And he is also known as Putin's chef, or at least he was. Um, but the two men appear, and we stress the word appear, to have grown apart in recent days. And Prigozhin has been quite critical. And he's also emerging, it seems, as a potential threat to Putin's authority. To discuss this interesting figure, I'm joined now by Paul Wood, who is a former world affairs correspondent for the BBC, and he's also working on a very long profile of Prigozhin. Paul, let's start with the uh, basic question, who is Evgeny Prigozhin? Well, in a curious way, he reminds me of another figure that we're both quite obsessed about, and that is Donald Trump. The personality is quite Trumpian. He's full of bombast, bombast. He doubles down whenever he's confronted. He's a master at trolling, just like Trump. And this is quite important when it comes to taking or not taking his statements at face value. The big difference is that while a lot of people assume Trump is a criminal, Prigozhin actually was a criminal. He got convicted of some quite serious offences in his youth. Uh, he did some burglaries aged 18. Then while he was on a suspended sentence, he did a lot more burglaries. And him and a gang, a gang that he appeared to lead, um, snuck up on this uh, poor woman. Prigozhin choked her. This is according to testimony from uh, others in the gang. Uh, he's always denied it. But according to the testimony, he choked her while somebody else pulled her boots off. And then as she fell unconscious to the ground, he pulled her earrings off. So for that, he got 10 years in a Soviet prison. And Soviet prisons are not like nice, friendly, gentle British prisons or even American prisons. These are penal colonies huge barracks-like structures where these are really quite rough places. Now, he survived and apparently prospered in this environment to emerge just as the Soviet Union was undergoing perestroika. And then, of course, it collapsed and Leningrad becomes St. Petersburg. And St. Petersburg is the Wild West. It's Chicago, as somebody put it to me. And he manages to start a very successful restaurant business there. First, he starts with hot dogs. Hot dogs uh, are not apparently widely sold in St. Petersburg at the time. Then he moves on to luxury restaurants. And then he has his big break, which is that the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, who happens to be Vladimir Putin, comes in one day and likes the food and then decides to bring his important guests, George Bush, President W. Bush, twice, for instance, and this all sounds quite trivial, and he's got this absurd nickname, Putin's chef. But um, as one analyst explained it to me, if it's St. Petersburg in the early 90s and everything's uh, just a little bit rackety and there isn't even a reliable food supply, but Putin can show his foreign guests, look, we can put on this huge uh, show of, of magnificent food and there's a bit of pageantry and there's a bit of theatre. That was actually quite an important function for Prigozhin. 
Of course, people who know the St. Petersburg restaurant scene in the 80s say, well, you'd also have had to have been pretty well connected in the criminal world to survive there and to get your food supply and not to have to give over all your um, profits in takings, uh, your um, profits in protection money. So this is, this is the figure that everybody knows at Putin's chef. He becomes the Kremlin's caterer. And off the back of that, he becomes the caterer to the entire Russian army and becomes a billionaire. And then this thing called the Wagner Group emerges, and it's all very mysterious. Nobody knows why it's called the Wagner Group. One theory is that an early field commander, a man called Dmitry Udkin, loved Wagner for his love of the Volk and, and this idea of, of a resurgent nationalism. That may or may not be true, who knows? Um, several figures called Udkin have popped up and there's a suspicion relayed to me by a St. Petersburg journalist that Prigozhin is actually finding people called Udkin and making them employees of Wagner just so he can perpetuate this idea of a figure called Udkin who's somehow related to it or another masterpiece of trolling. But during all this time, um, Prigozhin gave almost no media interviews. He gave one talking about the hot dog stall. And he always denied having anything to do with Wagner. Indeed, he sued journalists for it until suddenly in September of last year, he emerges as this very important figure in the war, which brings us right up to date. The British Ministry of Defence thinks that 50,000 Wagner Ofsi are fighting in Ukraine or were at the height of it. And they're really quite important for the war effort. And this has propelled Prigozhin, who has no official position in Russia, um, into the very front rank of the people fighting this war. He might even be after Putin, the face of the war in Ukraine, the Russian face of the war. And he's presenting himself uh, as a military figure, which is, uh, does he have any military background before this war? Other than the fact that he led the Wagner Group, does he have any military training or anything? Well, as far as we know, the only uniform he ever wore was a prison uniform. Um, but over many years, the Wagner Group uh, were active uh, when the Ukraine war started in 2014, 2015. They've been in Syria, they've been in Congo. He likes to appear in full battle dress in uh, flak jacket and helmet. Um, there are no badges of rank there and certainly he has no official position. And he's been involved in an extraordinary public power struggle with the Russian Ministry of Defence. These things um, normally take place behind closed doors in the Kremlin, but he's been publicly attacking them. Well, um, e even appearing to criticise Putin, although we can get into that in a minute. I don't, don't really buy it. Nobody can really get away with criticising Putin. And one, there's a, a former MI6 officer in London who um, prepares reports for private clients on Russia. And he showed me one of those reports a few months ago now, which said there's only one topic of, of conversation in the upper reaches of the Kremlin. And that's what to do with the Prigozhin problem. Uh, and this former MI6 officer was claiming there were several active plots to assassinate him, which sounds like something out of a spy novel, but a number of Russian officials have taken unfortunate falls out of their balconies on the fifth or sixth floor. So this is not unknown in Russian politics. So he, he's certainly skirting a very dangerous area in these public pronouncements. But whether this is sanctioned by Putin and Putin running things, you have this image of the sort of mafia don encouraging his employees to be at each other's throats in order to get the maximum out of them. That could be what's going on here as well. Well, well let's go with that working theory that it, it is somehow these criticisms of Russia are somehow sanctioned by Putin. What would be the thinking there? Would it be to, to tie into a Western narrative about Russian disharmony to, as a sort of smokescreen for actual military advances? Um, pick your theory, really. Um, Steve Bannon, the American uh, political consultant, had a way of describing how he dealt with the media, which is flood the zone with shit. I think that's what Prigozhin is doing. One of the things I left out of the truncated biography at the beginning is the fact that he was the guy running the so-called troll factory in 2016, which put out fake news onto Facebook and other places, uh, allegedly to throw the election for Donald Trump, although you look at what they put out and it was both for Trump and against Trump, flood the zone with shit, confuse the electorate, undermine the legitimacy of the process. So it, it could be that that's going on. It could be that Putin, you know, who is in a losing war, wants to embarrass the Ministry of Defence into doing certain things. It could be as simple as they don't, the Ministry of Defence, the, the Defence Minister, the Chief of Staff, don't like this upstart Prigozhin, haven't, as Prigozhin claims, given him the ammunition he needs, and he is desperate to do something about it. The, the surface explanation might be the correct explanation. Uh, we simply don't know. Um, somebody described to me what Prigozhin wants. Uh, this is somebody who knows Prigozhin, but it's only a theory that he wants to step into the role um, uh, vacated by the far right politician Vladimir Zhirinovsky, who died last year, 
which is kind of a licensed court jester. You say these extreme things and everybody knows they're extreme, but then Putin can point to you and say, look, if, if not me, this is the alternative. And so Prigozhin is licensed to do a lot of things which would get other people thrown into jail. And bear in mind, people are being thrown into jail in Russia for criticizing the war. And that technically private military companies, mercenary groups are illegal in Russia. And yet this is a man supplying 50,000 mercenaries to the front line in Ukraine. So um, I'm, I'm not sure he's gone rogue. I think this is a kind of rogue behavior that's licensed. Yeah, we, we should apologize uh, about Steve Bannon, not your language, Steve Bannon's language to spectator TV viewers. Yeah, I'm sorry, quote, quote, quoting Mr. Bannon. Um, <laughs> not spectator. Another, another set of reports have come out suggesting that Brigozin was uh, attempting to strike deals with the Ukrainians um, for strategic advantage. But again, do you think that could be fake news on the Ukrainian side? It's very hard to know what to believe uh, about anything in this war. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of fake news on both sides. And the story you're talking about here is that Prigozhin allegedly offered to give away Russian positions of the army, not his own fighters, in order for the Ukrainians to seize, uh, to cede Bakhmut, this town that has been at the center of a grinding war of attrition and very high losses by the Wagner Group for many months. So some background here, somebody who knows Prigozhin told me his ambition is to enter politics, but to do that, he has to come away from Ukraine with something looking like a victory. There was another town which the Russians um, managed to seize back from the Ukrainian counteroffensive a few months ago. Prigozhin tried to take the credit there, but it wasn't credible because regular Russian troops were involved. So he kind of said that he was going to take Bakhmut and um, Bakhmut was his and there were no other army forces there. So he kind of has to take this town if he's going to be credible. It has no strategic value. They could just go around it. It's purely, or it appears to be purely, about giving Prigozhin something he can call a victory. So if all of that is true and he really needs this and is prepared to sacrifice the lives of his men to do it, then perhaps it is credible he'd make this offer. And after all, he doesn't really care so much about the regular Russian troops, if you believe the people around him. But on the other hand, could be Ukrainian propaganda, could be propaganda from the Russian Ministry of Defense against Prigozhin, could be Prigozhin's own propaganda, who knows? I mean, trust no one, believe nothing. If, um, if, if it is sanctioned by Putin, this, this rogue behavior, does that suggest that uh, Putin and Prigozhin have, uh, and Putin and the Wagner group have uh, a better understanding than Putin in the army? And that, that in fact, that's the split there is between the Ministry of Defense and Putin and, and Wagner Group? I mean, the Wagner Group is useful in a number of ways. One, they were allowed into prisons to recruit. And Prigozhin does have a lot of credibility with prisoners. He can say, as he did say, look, I was you once, and look at me now. I'm a holder of the hero of, of, of Russia metal. You, you too could follow in my footsteps. And he did manage to recruit a lot of people, 40 or 50,000 of them, uh, to go to Ukraine. Um, there's another way that Wagner is useful for the Kremlin, which is the line of command isn't clear. If, if somebody from Wagner commits war crimes and they seem, because, you know, some of them are not the most upstanding citizens to have been doing a lot of raping, a lot of killing, a lot of looting. If somebody does that, or even if there's a large scale massacre, which is carried out for strategic reasons. And at the beginning of the war, it appears the Russians were literally trying to terrify the Ukrainians into a rapid collapse of morale and, and a rapid surrender. All of those things are much easier to deny if it's irregular forces. I mean, everybody assumes, it's pretty threadbare deniability, everybody assumes that Wagner's getting its orders and its money and its weapons from the Russian state, but you can't, it's more difficult to prove. So those are two very useful functions that are already taking place. But it doesn't mean they're the main part of the war effort. And presumably the actual generals and the actual Minister of Defense is quite resentful of all this. Um, this just seems to be how Putin runs the Kremlin. I once spoke to a former... Russian uh, intelligence colonel who said, you know, it, it's like a, a medieval court with, with different sort of barons and, and Putin sets them against each other. Or like, as I said, a mafia don where the boss says, I want this to be done. And he just lets people get on with it. And the, the person who comes back having done it gets certain rewards in future. That may be what we're seeing here. Or it could be that Prigozhin is just as crazy as he looks. And it's certainly crazy in Putin's Russia to even appear to be criticizing Putin. And some of his com comments recently well, not naming Putin, but seem to have, have, have been skirting on trying to blame people right at the very top. And that is very dangerous 
for Prigozhin, because even though he's got this army, he doesn't pay the wages. The wages come through the Kremlin. The wages come through one of the intelligence agencies. It's not like he's got 10,000 or 30,000 brand shirts who are personally loyal to him that he can call to Moscow. And even if he did, there are a lot of forces in Moscow at President Putin's behest. So um, I, I don't buy, and a lot of people I've spoken to don't buy this claim that he's challenging Putin and could be the next Russian president. He's challenging the people below Putin for Putin's favour. So you don't think, I mean, a lot of people would have said the same about Donald Trump in, in 2012, 2013, written off. You don't think we, we could be seeing a, a Trump-like figure uh, emerge as Putin's successor? Well, perhaps his most significant asset is not these tens of thousands of of fighters, but it's the hundreds of thousands of fanboys and fangirls on social media that Wagner has built. I mean, it's quite frightening if you look at, for instance, Reverse Side of the Medal, which is a Telegram and Twitter channel, um, where people who appear to be fighting in Ukraine post these videos of themselves in Ukraine, and then lots of people in Russia say how wonderful it is. And that presumably is an electoral asset for Prigozhin if he did run for national office or tried to get into the Duma. It's presumably a fundraising asset. Indeed, I've been told they've already been raising funds, some of which have gone to Ukraine. But the big difference between Russia and, and the United States is that, that you can do all this in Russia and somebody will still push you out of a balcony if you get too big for your boots. Um, so I think that Prigozhin can only remain as a national figure and can only enter the Duma or take over a political party or even take over St. Petersburg, which is one of the things it's alleged he's trying to do. He can only do that with Putin's say-so. Paul Wood, thank you very much for coming on to Spectator TV. Now, barely a day goes by without a news story about how AI or artificial intelligence is going to disrupt something massive uh, in our society. Um, we had an interesting piece on Spectator Life this week suggesting that AI is in the process of disrupting dating apps and will particularly unseat Tinder, which is the giant of dating apps. I'm Delighted to be joined by Jake Kozlaski, who is the co-founder of a dating app that uses AI called Keeper. Um, Jake, tell us a little bit about Keeper uh, and how AI can enhance online dating. Definitely. Um, so Keeper at, at a super high level, you know, you, you called it a dating app. We actually, uh, we, we like to talk about it as a family formation app, not a dating app. Um, the, re the reason for that is, uh, you know, dating apps are great for get, getting you on dates, for, for uh, you know, helping you meet new people. Um, but that's not actually the goal that most people have, right? Most people don't want a, a litany of dates. Uh, they don't want to spend all their time dating. What they want to do, um, and even Match Group, who owns Tinder, has released surveys that, that uh, back up this claim. What they really want is just to find that one person that they want to spend the rest of their life with and, and start a family with, right? 81% of, of Gen Zs uh, uh, say that that's their top goal right now um, is, is in terms of the dating uh, landscape is to you know find a long-term committed relationship in this year. Um, and so Keeper is built all around that. We're, we're not a, a dating product. We're a product that uses AI to introduce you to that one person who is the most ideal fit for you in every dimension that you have. Um, and so we use AI to do what a traditional matchmaker would do, basically learn about who you are as a person, uh, both physically, personality-wise, you know, everything about you, your preferences, um, and then disambiguate uh, you with all the other people in our database and see, okay, you know, who is the absolute strongest fit on every dimension, every, every uh, preference completely open-ended that you tell us. Um, and then we introduce you to that person once we have them. Uh, and so that's a very different experience than, you know, here's 10,000 profiles, swipe right or left, based on like photos and a couple, couple lines of text. It's interesting you say that about Gen Z, because I suppose that uh, suggests, again, that that generation are moving away from what we think young people are supposed to do, which is play the field, uh, have a fun time trying to figure out who's right for them and so on. For sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I think uh, there, there's a couple components to this. COVID definitely um, uh, gave a lot of people uh, feelings of isolation and loneliness. And so it's sort of, uh, you know, there, there's been a reaction to that of like a, a realization, I guess, among the younger generation that, you know, actually meaningful relationships are, are very important and, and finding deep connection is, is something that they desire. Um, 
at the same time, though, you know, there's there's a lot of good research on like family formation intention, uh, fertility intention, for example, um, over the last hundred years, and it actually hasn't changed that much. Uh, uh, on average, people today want about three kids, um, and that's been the, that was the same for uh, our grandparents' generation, right? Um, what I think has changed is uh, uh, the means by which people achieve that. Um, you know, there was a lot of social scaffolding, sort of cultural norms around how you would date, how you would find a partner, which have gone out the window. Um, and you can't, you know, in, in my opinion, at least, you can't sort of turn the clock back on that. But what you can do is is move forward uh, and use the technology that we do have today to help people achieve uh, what they want in terms of those goals. I'm going to be incredibly simplistic, uh, and you can tell me that I'm wrong. Let's say I tell Keeper, as, a, as a, somebody who wants to find a match, uh, that I would like in the future to have three children. Would Keeper then automatically match me with, with someone who also wants three children, or is it a lot more complicated than that? Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, typically it, it would be more than just a single preference that people provide. Uh, but if that truly was, you know, your only preference, then that would be the one that we match you based on. Um, but yeah, I mean, a number of kids uh, is, is something we, we collect from everybody. So there's sort of two categories, right? There's things we ask everybody and then there's uh, we, we give our users the opportunity to just tell us what they want. Um uh, and so that's where, you know, things get really interesting. That's where you have uh, natural language processing, like GPT style uh, AI kind of handles that in the way a human would. Um, but yes, if, if you know, your one of your preferences is to have three kids, uh, we'll typically only match you with people who also want three kids. Um, there is some gray area with, with this stuff. So, you know, if, if we have your, your dream woman on 99% of your criteria, but this one thing is off and maybe she wants two kids instead of three or something like that, you know, there is room to kind of uh, uh, have the AI generate a question for her or you in terms of like, how flexible are you on this? Or if we did find your dream person, but um, they only wanted two kids instead of three, like, would you still want that? So uh, that is the challenge of it, right? Is, is, um, People are, are not black and white in terms of their preferences, uh, but they do generally want what they want. And so threading that needle is, is uh, uh, you know, what, what we're focused on, on building from a, an automation standpoint. Do you think that uh, the AI or the algorithm or whatever it is knows uh, what people want more than they know? So does it work on information beyond what they are telling you? And how does it do that? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. So um, the short answer is yes. Uh, uh, it will get much better at that in the long run. You know, the bigger our, our data set is, the more information we have on uh, successful matches and failed matches in the past. Um, this is something that incumbent dating apps uh, actually do have quite a bit of data on. And, um, you know, that's an advantage that they have. Um, but uh, we, we do use... Uh, uh, basically, like psychology research, um, uh, there's a lot of research on, uh, you know, what traits indicate successful long-term relationships. There's also a lot of research on uh, what traits men and women on average are, tend to be attracted to in, in a partner. Um, and some people, you know, are, are very <laughs> upfront about these preferences or, or they understand themselves. And some people, uh, you know, are, are more shy to kind of share them. And so... Um, We'll make some assumptions, uh, basically, if you don't share them. Uh, we'll also, we also might give you some pushback, right? If you're a six foot three woman and you say you want a five foot two man, like maybe, but you know, that on average, that's typically not the norm. And so we'll just make sure that that's actually what you want. Um, so there, it's again, it's, it's a very, uh, it's none of this is black and white. Um, it's sort of handling different scenarios, uh, based on what comes. Uh, but we do pull a lot from the research. Um, the research literature in the long run, uh, we're going to, going to be making assumptions based on our own data set and what our AI learns from it. Uh, and I mean, is it sort of cheesy of me to say uh, that you, you, do people object to the idea that computer science can, can solve the mysteries of the heart? <laughs> yes, for sure. Um, I think, uh, you know, there, there's something, there, there's something that feels, uh, you know, human or, or uh, you know, literally romantic uh, in what we're doing. And so the idea that, you know, you can mathematically address these things, I think is is understandably unappealing to a lot of people, right? Um, 
uh, at the same time, like I, I sympathize with that. I, I, you know, emotionally or spiritually uh, uh, understand where they're coming from. Um, but I think ultimately uh, it is solvable uh, with, with this stuff. And, you know, I, I don't think the, the emotional negative reaction to it is, is a strong enough justification to not do it. Like I, I would rather live in a world where, you know, you can sign up for a product and be matched with the love of your life at any point immediately. Um, like, I think that would be an amazing world. Uh, and one that I would rather live in. And what's your emotional response to, cause you're doing the type of AI that connects people. Uh, but of course, there's another AI that's connected to the world of dating, which is to come up with um, AI that actually is the partner, um, mm. so that you can have a partner who's a bot and will tell you all the things you want to hear. Um, right. How do you respond to that? Do you find that creepy? Um, yeah, I, I, I think you know my emotional response to that is is just it's kind of sad. I I, I think uh, there's a lot of men today who are already sucked into kind of that world uh with you know porn video games sort of these these uh uh hyper stimuli that allow us to escape from from the real world uh and yeah i mean i i think you know those it's kind of uh there's a lot of lost souls out there who who get trapped uh in that um so yeah i, I think it's really sad I, I think um you know i there might be very specific edge cases where you know somebody is just in such a bad situation physically or what have you, where like, okay, maybe, you know, putting them on morphine is better than, <laughs> better than forcing them to suffer. But I think uh, there's, you know, far more 99% of the guys that are in that situation are not uh, uh, in that category. And so, yeah, I, I think it's really sad. I, I, it's not something that um, I would spend my time focused on building. I, I think, uh, you know, real world, real, real relationships are, are the meaningful route and, and the one that most guys should aspire towards. And do you find uh, you, the preponderance of your clients are men? And am I right in saying that you, you charge men for using stuff, but you don't charge women? Is that right? Um, yeah. So 55% of all of our users are female. Uh, we, we do charge um, some women. Uh, right now, we're set up to, to mostly focus on acquiring men as the paid users. Uh, we're kind of still exploring that, so it might change uh, here pretty soon. Um, but for now, uh, most of the matches we make are, are the men paying. Jake, I think we'll end it there, but uh, thank you very much for uh, coming onto The Spectator TV. That's it for uh the week in 60 minutes this week i hope you've enjoyed watching it and found us to be your perfect match uh don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel again do that by clicking that button at the bottom of your screen and then tapping the bell icon to make sure you never ever miss an episode thanks very much for watching come back next week <laughs>